All right, guys, you asked for it. This is another video with Bart K. We dig into a little bit more of the details around energetics, the essential governor theory, how our body processes fuel, particularly for physical activity, um, and just kind of follow up on the discussions we had in our previous video where we talk about uh, macros and just how the body works biologically with food. So more discussion, more information, more details. There may be some stuff in here that's different than you've ever heard before. That's what this is about. This is about finding out information and thinking about things in a different way. Okay. If you learned something from this video, please do me a favor, subscribe to the channel, share this information out with other people. The more people we can get information to, the more we can educate people and give them information that's going to help them make better decisions to improve their quality of life. And that's what this is all about. Okay. Remember, knowledge is only power if you're taking action to make something happen. All right. So we want to get knowledge out there, give people an opportunity to do things to help themselves get better. All right. Hope you hope you like what we got going on here today. It's a great conversation. You might learn something. Awesome. All right. Well, welcome, Professor Bart. Wait, what does that say? Bart WTK. I did, did that say that yeah. before? I didn't realize all that was in there. Yeah, the it's, last a, it's time. been there for a while. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's the whole the whole thing. So well, well you, the whole thing is Field Marshal Lord Doctor Professor Bart WTK, if you like. But <laughs> hey, Bart, fine. <laughs> Do you prefer Professor Bart, Professor K? Um, Bart is fine. Bart is fine. Okay. Um, well, thank you for being on again. We had you on recently, uh, a couple of weeks ago. We talked about some really good stuff with just uh, all of the ways we could do keto wrong, right? That's that's kind of what I titled it. And and mm -hmm. uh, it's been very, it's one of, one of my most popular videos I know on my channel. Uh, we brought up a lot of good stuff, answered some questions for a lot of people, and then created some questions for a lot of people. Um, we're going to talk a little bit, I think today we talked a little previously, we're going to talk about the central governor theory. We're going to talk about energetics, basically how does the body utilize energy um, when maybe in, we can tie into there, cause I know this is a, definitely a topic that you have a, an opinion on is, is heat energy versus chemical energy mm. and calories and where that all plays into this whole thing. So there's probably yeah. a handful of things that we'll talk about that kind of are related to all of these discussions. So, um, cool bananas. lead me astray. I shall follow. Yeah. <laughs> so let's start with, um, the, Let's start with energetics. I think let's get a baseline for when we talk about how we use energy. What is energetics when we talk about biology, physiology, and the human body? Right. So energetics is a field of study that is concerned with the means, biochemically, physically, by which energy is provided to our working cells to allow those cells to do their work it's draws on aspects of pure and applied physics okay there's some quantum stuff that comes into it a bit depending on how deep down the uh, down the rabbit warren you want to dig definitely biochemistry comes into it as well as pure and applied physics but ostensibly, it's a description of how energy moves from thing to thing and from form to form in such a way as to allow ourselves to do what they do that keep us alive and functional. Okay. And what are the components when it comes to our bodies? What, what, what are the things that go into that? Well, energy in is in the form of mass that mass being the carbon skeletons mm -hmm. with appended hydrogens on them that we derive from carbohydrate food sources or free fatty acids or in an emergency situation from proteins or from alcohol. Mm -hmm. So energy in is in a particular form and that, that form is mass physical okay. stuff, okay. food. Yep. What our body does with that mass, that physical stuff, is it changes the mass from one form, carbon skeletons with hydrogens attached, into a different form, 
okay. that form being water, H2O, and carbon dioxide, CO2, a different form of the same amount of mass. In changing the carbon skeletons with hydrogens attached into water and carbon dioxide gas, chemical energy is released and some of that chemical energy is encapsulated and used to store that energy in another chemical form, that form being ATP. Okay. And then when your cell wants to spend energy to do cellular work, it hydrolyzes, splits the ATP that was generated from the energy from the food, and that liberates an ADP plus mm -hmm. an organic phosphate, which then has to be recombined together to restore the energy in that high energy bond. And the way the body does that is by oxidizing more food stuff and producing more carbon dioxide and more water. Okay. So in, in, a, can, so in layman's terms, is I, I, we often talk about, I think most people understand ATP as kind of being everything becomes ATP and that's what your body utilizes for energy. Mm. doesn't matter if it's what you're eating, everything's got to get to ATP somehow. Yeah. So whether you're eating carbohydrates or fats or protein or alcohol or a mix of all of those things, mm -hmm. all of those things are oxidized by our body, reacted chemically with oxygen, basically, mm -hmm. in a controlled fashion, such that the chemical energy released by the transmutation of those things into carbon dioxide and water, it's that energy that's used to take an ADP and an inorganic phosphate and jam them together into a high energy configuration, that, that being ATP. Mm -hmm. Then that ATP is used for energy split to release the energy that was stored there previously, thus returning it to its low energy state, meaning that it needs to be re-energized again with the oxidation of more food, whatever that okay. food source is. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, so really when we're talking about for instance, if we talk about in the sports world, where it's, you know, we're talking about max lifts or short burst intense work where it's the phosphogenic ATP pathway, we're mm. really talking about utilizing ATP and then reconnecting it. So we talk about replenishing the ATP. It's not really replenishing ATP. It's just re-energizing it. That's an interesting. Yeah. And it's, it's a cycle because when, mm -hmm. when ATP is used for energy, that reduces the concentration of ATP by one. Mm -hmm. for one that's used and increases the concentration of both ADP and an organic phosphate, both by one. Right. Those signals are picked up by the cell, those concentration gradient signals, mm -hmm. and those things upregulate the speed at which those things are resynthesized. So it's really actually a cycle mm -hmm. that, okay. is, that has, a, has its own feedback, its own throttle to some yeah. degree. So, that's so throttle. So you're, you're making me think about something that I'm going to ask about this specific cycle or system or mechanics. I don't know whichever word makes the most sense, but mm -hmm. I think applies to all systems and is, is the effect of general adaptation syndrome, supercompensation and the improvement of a system by adding stress yeah. and then allowing it time to recover. Does that apply to this process? And then by, and then also all processes. So I like to talk about things like ketogenesis, gluconeogenesis, and just all sorts of different things. Like if you're not using a system, if you're not challenging it and telling it that it needs a to perform better based on demand, then it's not going to ever get better. Yeah. Does that apply okay. to all systems? Yeah, and it, is this one of them? It, it, it does in a way, but it's a way that we need to understand. And this feathers in really well to the discussion on governor theory. Mm -hmm. And here it is. When you lift the heaviest possible weight you can lift at the maximum volitional power output you can produce with your muscles, let's say you're doing a set of three with an immense weight that will, that will cave you in in three reps, mm -hmm. your ATP concentration in your cell at the end of that three reps, no, is not. Oh, produced. no. Okay. No, that's the thing that people miss. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What, the thing that's reduced is your glycogen storage in the muscle cell. Okay. That's the thing that responds to training. That's the thing that increases its resting value 
in response to the stress of the training. So the replenishment of that glycogen? Yes. Yeah. The okay. reason being is that the concentration of ATP in a cell is jealously guarded, protected by homeostatic mechanism. Mm -hmm. For obvious reason, or when you think about it. If the concentration of ATP inside a cell was allowed to drop, then that cell is at very, very serious risk of death. Okay. Because almost everything a cell does requires ATP. Right. So that, that concentration has to be held constant. So, so you use ATP at a higher rate, your body produces it at a higher rate. The cost of that is the expenditure of the glycogen at a faster rate. That's the concentration that drops. So the, so the conversion of glycogen to ATP is super fast, is what you're saying. Super fast. Okay, now does this is this where the one to two minute recovery time? So you look at power lifters and there's the the consistent uh, practice of I'm doing a heavy lift. I'm going to wait a minute to four minutes in some cases, depending mm -hmm. on how the volume and things, um, yep. because I want my ATP to replenish in between sets. Yeah, it's not is ATP, it really? It's not really ATP. It's uh, it's the glycogen. Interesting. It's the glycogen that needs to replace. Here's the thing. ATP energy ultimately depends entirely upon the functioning of our mitochondria. Mm -hmm. Now, a lot of people think that what a mitochondria does is it reacts food substances with oxygen and produces ATP. And then people imagine for some reason that the mitochondria is, is exuding ATP out into the cell. No, it's not doing that at all. What a mitochondria is doing is it's jamming an ATP together from an ADP plus an inorganic phosphate. And it's using the energy of oxidizing the food substances to do that jamming together. Okay. Then that ATP is immediately hydrolyzed, split inside the mitochondria by the mitochondria that's just made it mm -hmm. immediately. Bam. Why does it do that? It does that because on the other side of the membrane of the mitochondria is like another gear that's attached to it. And that gear takes a creatine molecule and an inorganic phosphate out there, and it jams those together, making phosphocreatine. Then the mitochondria takes that ADP and the phosphate and jams it back together to form another ATP, mm -hmm. thus holding the concentration stable. So it's like an assembly, it's like an assembly line inside the cell. It's it's a shuttle. Yeah. And what happens is the mitochondria produces energy and it rolls along at a steady state your oxygen consumption doesn't move upwards and downwards rapidly. It takes about three minutes for your oxygen consumption to reach a new steady state if you change exercise intensity upwards or downwards. Mm -hmm. The reason for that is because that whole system has massive inertia. Inertia is resistance to change in momentum. For mm -hmm. those that want a definition of that. Yeah. But you can't speed up your oxygen consumption quickly and you can't slow it down quickly. It rolls along at a steady state, so we draw a straight line across a graph right? pretty much over time. Think about how a muscle contraction works. Bang! Yep. Bang! Bang! Quickly, rapidly, fully and completely, or not at all, is how a muscle fiber contracts. Mm -hmm. It takes 10 to 40 milliseconds. Bang! During that 10 to 40 milliseconds, thousandths of a second that is yeah the requirement for that cell to use atp to fire that contraction goes up by orders of magnitude huge orders of magnitude there is no way the oxygen consumption system could keep up to subserve and slow down again it doesn't do that right that rolls along at a steady state because of the inertia mm -hmm. therefore we need another means to produce the atp rapidly to do that sliding filaments all sliding filaments and all muscle fibers of all muscle fiber types rely entirely on glycogenolysis to do that task so when you contract a muscle it's the glycogen that gets dragged down mm -hmm. then what happens is let's say you're doing rhythmic activity at one contraction per muscle fiber per second right 10 to 40 milliseconds bam now you've got 990 milliseconds, give or take, to replenish the glycogen in that cell. Mm -hmm. How is that done? 
glucose comes in from the blood to subserve the creation of the new glycogen. And the energy is translated from the mitochondria to the sliding filaments by the phosphocreatine system. Take any one of those gears out of a muscle cell, any muscle cell, mm -hmm. and it will stop functioning immediately. And the difference between that and a longer gap, when does oxygen play more of a role in that process? Well, the, 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 the great thing is if you take the graph mm -hmm. of the oxygen consumption, that steady mm -hmm. line, and you compare that to the pulsatile line of the contractions, what you'll find is the area under those two curves, if you integrate the area underneath the line, yep. it's the same. Okay. Meaning that the oxygen consumption is at all times exactly what it ought to be across time on average to subserve the energetic needs of the individual. Okay. So, so when your oxygen consumption goes up, it's because your rate of you either the rate that the time between contractions shortens or the intensity of the contractions increases or both. Gotcha. Both of those things will drag your oxygen consumption up, but it will take about three minutes to reach its new steady state because okay. of that inertia. Okay. Okay, and so so this is going into another area um, before we get to the central governor stuff, and mm -hmm. that is what is the difference between aerobic and anaerobic effort? Right, there is no difference. <laughs> there, there is no such Woo! thing as aerobic as anaerobic exercise in in higher creatures, multicellular creatures like human beings. Okay, what I've just said, if you understand what I just said, yep. All muscle contractions produce energy in the mitochondria, mm -hmm. translate that energy through a cellular mechanism of phosphocreatine cycle to the site that the work is done, the sliding filaments. That work is all glycogenolysis. Okay. So, so, where, does, all so where does the uh, concept of anaerobic and aerobic come into play? And when we talk about the three metabolic pathways, phosphogenic, right. glycolytic, and oxidative. It comes, it comes from poor understanding of the integrated functioning of human physiology. It comes from poor teaching practice. Mm -hmm. It comes from reductionism. It comes mm. from oversimplification. It comes from teaching students like idiots and therefore turning them into idiots. <laughs> okay. okay, so... That's interesting. No, because I mean, that is a whole concept that that's a whole set of information that um, is different than, I mean, I've ever heard. It's I mean, I, I've understood that before. oxygen played a role in all of it, but I was always, I was always taught and through all the training and certifications I've ever had, there's three metabolic mm -hmm. pathways, right? Um, yeah, there isn't, there's one and it has three yeah. gears. Well, actually there's not even three, there's four. There's a fourth gear they don't even teach you. Yeah, I, I, yeah. yeah so. I like, I like that even better. Okay. So it's one, but it, I like the gears concept that mm. makes a whole much, that makes, makes a lot more sense than. Right. And so what path, that tells us separate is you pathways. take any one of those gears out, you immediately somehow magically get into a muscle cell and yeah. have some kind of machinery that can grab that gear and pluck it out of that cell immediately. Okay. That cell will immediately stop functioning. It right. cannot function because yeah. we are now not translating the energy from where it's produced yeah. mitochondria to where it's spent in the sliding filaments. So the concept of the metabolic pathways, I know in exercise science, in most places it's used to uh, have an overlay of the type of work that's being done and where the focus mm -hmm. of the energy is coming from. Is that mm -hmm. still a, is that still a relation? If we talk about it from a gears perspective, if I'm Not doing really. short burst, burst work, it's primarily using the ATP as the energy source for that work. Mm -hmm. I may that need to re, I may need to replenish my glycogen to create more yep. okay. but it's that that understanding comes from two fundamental errors of interpretation okay the first one is they use respiratory gas analysis to estimate what a person is oxidizing during an exercise bout at different intensities and they assert that at rest you're burning almost entirely fat no carbohydrates and at the point of volitional exhaustion at the end of a rampwise test to exhaustion, you're using all carbohydrates and no fats. And 
Then they draw this graph where they say, look, uh, energy uptake from oxygen follows this graph. And then you've got the lactic system in here in the middle. And then you've got the PCR system at the very, very thin end. And yep. that's how long these things last. And different exercise at different intensities taxes the different systems to different degrees. 100%. False because those assertions are all made on the basis of muscle biopsies that were taken in the 30s and 40s okay. of the last century using the fastest known freeze-drying techniques that were possible at that time to get what chemical concentrations were there at different, you know, mm -hmm. that kind of stuff. Unfortunately, what they missed entirely was something that a, a, a research team headed by Shulman with co-worker Rothman uncovered and I think it was about 1993 from memory they had a very very fast scanner that was capable of doing magnetic resonance spectroscopy on phosphorus and they were able to trace the ATP usage that way okay. and trace the rate of um, glycolysis and glycogen resynthesis basically and what they found was that this whole bam 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 thing they found that the peaks were orders of magnitude higher than they could possibly have imagined with the slow freeze drying technique and they resolved in terms of the resynthesis of glycogen in between contractions far more rapidly than the freeze drying could detect and as such the freeze drying techniques were suggesting that at low intensities you're using basically no glycogen it's mm. all Using basically no glucose, no glycogen, it's all it's all aerobic. ATP, right? It's all, right. Yeah. nonsense. Interesting. False. All muscle contractions require absolutely that glycogen is the sole fuel source that provides the ATP for the sliding filament contractions to occur. All okay. of them. Okay. So all muscle fibers require PCR to get that energy there in the first place. Yep. All muscle cells require mitochondria to consume oxygen and produce ATP at a steady rate to subserve that across time. All of them. Awesome. Okay. So where yeah. does, okay. So now the big question, you mm -hmm. just said everything is oxygen and glycogen. Where does being ketogenic athlete come into play with this? Um, how it comes in is that it debunks any requirement that you need to consume a large amount of carbohydrate in your diet mm -hmm. to serve high intensity muscle work. A, because all muscle work requires glycogen at mm. all intensities, all of it. Obviously the absolute amount of glycogen being turned over per unit time is lower at low intensity exercise than it is at higher. But nonetheless, all muscle contractions require glycogen. The resting glycogen level is a training related uh, level as you train so shall you perform if you use glycogen in a certain way in a muscle fiber that muscle fiber will learn to collect and have a resting level of glycogen to subserve that use so that's what happens the glycogen is formed from blood glucose but that glucose that comes in from the blood to be formed into glycogen in the muscle cells the muscle cell cares exactly not one jot whether that glucose was consumed in the diet or whether it was generated by the person using gluconeogenesis. Right. Okay. So fully fat adapted athletes, fully ketogenic athletes perform as well, if not better than carbed athletes in all sports of all intensity profiles up to and including high intensity work. Okay. Now that goes into the next question of what is the process? Because this is something I honestly am surprised that I personally, I've been looking for years and I have not really found much. And now maybe my Google food just isn't that good. I'm not sure what okay. it is, but I haven't been able to find much on the rate of glycogen replenishment on a low carb diet. Right. And is it faster does it make a difference? Is it even, is it comparable to so many? Everything I see is obviously if you eat carbs, it's going to replenish faster, which kind of makes sense, but it just seems okay. like it's a much cleaner process and it would be yes. better to let your body if, do it on its own. If you pile in a huge bolus of carbohydrate after an exhausting exercise session, mm -hmm. 
and you have this vast level of glucose in your blood after that, its concentrate, concentration gradient in the blood will push it through the system, meaning that that system will replete more rapidly. You will more rapidly replete your glycogen after the exercise session to its resting level. Yep. Here's the problem. The whole point of the exercise was to deplete the glycogen so that the cell is distressed, so that that cell then decides, I better store more glycogen in the future. If you more rapidly replete that glycogen, you shorten that period of distress on that muscle cell, and who's to say you're not negatively impacting what your cell decides to do with its resting level? Mm -hmm. While you're at it, once your, cell, your muscle cells are full of glycogen, to whatever level that's going to be, then you've still got a whole bunch of glucose in your bloodstream because you've eaten a whole bunch of carbs well above what your muscles can possibly absorb. Yeah. Now you're going to activate the Randall cycle, inflammation, and it's going to be a problem for you. Okay. And then, yeah. And then there's the, just the, the other aspect of if we're trying to enhance systems that our body already has, mm -hmm. why are we introducing something that's going to not allow that to work? So if we know gluconeogenesis right. is going to help do that job, then mm -hmm. we're adding something else that's interrupt, interrupting. We're inter and that's, yeah. we love to do this, right? We're too smart. We're going to interrupt all these things because we know better than our body does. Yeah. Okay. No. Now, uh, something you just said pinged another question in my head uh, that I think a lot of people overestimate, mm -hmm. but I'd like to hear your thoughts on how much fuel is actually used when we exercise. Because one of the things that I know I love to talk, I, I love to, talk to people about yeah. is, you know, stop counting the calories on your, your smartwatch when you're exercising, because that's not telling you what you're actually burning, not regardless of the whole calories thing, which we'll talk about mm -hmm. as well. But mm -hmm. just that we, you know, how do you, if someone's trying to track how much glycogen am I burning, is it even possible? It's possible to get a ballpark guesstimate without really, really expensive, really technical radio isotope labeling of stuff to absolutely mm -hmm. know what is doing what. The closest you're going to get is with indirect calorimetry, which, in other words, is respiratory gas analysis. Okay. That will give you a reasonable guesstimation of how much of the different um, fuel sources, carb and or fat you're using relative to one another and also absolute values per unit time of exercise. Mm -hmm. That's ballpark. That's near enough. So you can get a pretty, a pretty accurate gauge of what you, you, you are using in terms of those substances. But that will not give you a gauge on the energy that you've used. Okay. Because that's a different thing entirely. That How is that a different a... thing, Bart? How is that different? Please explain. Well, because one of them, because energy comes in a lot of different forms. Yeah. And it has a limited convertibility or to be able to convert those forms of energy mm -hmm. from one to the other. Now, you need to understand that energy is a construct. It's a concept. It has no definition other than the capacity to do work. Mm -hmm. It's a circular thing. Yes. Work being force applied over a set distance. F times D is work and energy is capacity to do work. Right. So, uh, yeah, right. So mass is one form of energy. What, what the human body deals with in terms of energy, the sources that it uses to produce energy are mass. They are carbon skeletons that, that are oxidized, chemically altered, Mm -hmm. And what is produced is carbon dioxide and water, mm -hmm. another form of mass. Mm -hmm. The energy that's produced, the capacity to do work, is transferred from the release of capacity to do work, the exothermic reactions of splitting those carbon skeletons, and it's encapsulated by ADP and PI and jamming that together and making ATP, stored chemical energy. Okay. And then the human body uses chemical energy to do work, and in the process of doing that, heat is released and lost to entropy. Okay, so heat is released, and that's another word that people might be uh, familiar with there is thermogenesis, is that, was that mm -hmm. or the thermic yeah. effect of food yeah. or whatever it may yeah. be. Yeah. Um, 
So essentially what you're saying, because if I'm not, if I'm correct, calories are a measure of heat energy. So yeah. what you're saying then is that the body actually utilizes chemical energy and produces calories when it does that. It if we're talking about calories, it loses calories to entropy. To the loses universe. to entropy. They just kind of go yeah. out there, right? They, they are exuded out to the universe, yes. So that relationship, how does that make, if there's a way that we can take that and explain to people how that pretty much makes calories pointless when we're talking mm -hmm. about how many, because mm -hmm. I see it all the time. People ask me like, how many calories should I eat in a day? And my response mm -hmm. to them is none, because you can't eat calories. Yeah. Correct. But they you don't, nobody food. understands that because everything they've been told is that you have to measure your food and calories. Yes. Well, that's because the scientific community at large have decided to use the calorie as the measurement of energy in foods. And they've done that largely because of the laziness and the difficulties in actually pinning down how to accurately measure energy in, it, in the effective form used by human beings, chemical energy. Mm -hmm. And instead they go, oh, we'll just use heat energy because then they invoke the first law of thermodynamics and say, well, heat energy is the same thing as kinetic energy. So energy comes in many different forms and that can be changed from one form to another. Uh, and, uh, and so therefore that's perfectly um, logical and, and um, indicated and correct methodology. And what's this crazy bald man talking about anyway? Right. Well, but it's the scientific way of underpinning their, the whole move, move more, yes. eat less, because now they have, they have science that can justify the message yes. on. It's just about moderation. It's just about yes. self-control. And then, and then they, and, not in, what you eat. and then they incorrectly misquote the first law of thermodynamics. And they suggest that the first law of thermodynamics says energy can't be created or destroyed. It can only be changed from form to form. That's actually not what the first law of thermodynamics says at all. What that's, what that, what's just been quoted there is a generalization of the law of conservation of energy. Mm. The first law of thermodynamics is a um, case limited specific application of that concept of conservation of energy which is also wrong by the way but that's for another day we'll get to <laughs> conservation of energy being wrong another day um and what it says is that the total internal energy of a closed thermodynamic system is equal to the specific heat of that system minus any work done mm. that's all it says and what it, what it basically says, the practical upshot of the first law of thermodynamics, and the reason it was put together in the first place, was to mm -hmm. explain an observation that was made, which was, if you heat water up to boiling, the force of that water expanding out, the thermal force of that, can be used in a closed piston system to drive that piston and cause the wheels of a train to move so we can move things along a track from place to place. Right. So we're taking so one energy type of energy and transfer it into physical another. work. Yep. Yep. However, yep. we need a piece of kit to change that heat energy into physical work because if that piston system does not exist to encapsulate that heat and prevent it from escaping to entropy, then the train goes nowhere, does it? Right. You can heat up as much water as you like, burn as much coal as you want to in a boiler. If there's no piston system to contain that steam energy, it escapes to entropy and the train sits absolutely still. There is no mechanism for the human body to encapsulate heat and use that for metabolic process. We require chemical energy, which we must derive from carbohydrates, fats, sometimes protein, and hopefully less often than that, alcohol. Uh, alcohol. <laughs> awesome. I hope that helps people understand right. so that's why it. we shouldn't be using calories because they're not really a thing. Our body can't use calories. And no. I think that just the concept of that, I think people's minds right now might be exploding. Uh, let's get, let's take that and talk about, we talked about all the energy stuff. Let's talk about what is the central governor theory. Um, yep. I know I first heard about it from Dr. Saivas earlier this year on the cruise when we were speaking on the cruise together um, yep. and dug into a little bit more. He talked about it again on our last video, dug into a little bit more. I know so it's something that Professor Noakes talks about a lot. Yep. Um, what is, what is it? And 
what is the the current understanding? How is it used? What does it mean? It, right. Okay. So you're quite right. The central governor theory was proposed originally by Professor Tim Noakes, an exercise physiologist of some repute, repute and indeed ill repute at various times during his career <laughs> for various reasons. Um, what it, to boil it down to, to be as parsimonious and simple as possible, what it suggests is this. Given what I was talking about with the way muscles work, mm -hmm. for a muscle to continue to perform, there must be glucose available in the blood to draw into the muscle cell to replenish glycogen in between contractions. Right. If the level of glycogen in the blood begins to drop, it can put us in a dangerous situation if our muscles continue to contract at the same intensity they were when our blood sugar was higher because we might run out of glycogen. Mm -hmm. And as soon as you run out of glycogen altogether, that muscle cell will lock. It will undergo irreversible tetanus in whatever position it's in at that instant in time. Okay. Then it will die. Cell necrosis is what will happen. So we must not allow a muscle to draw down energy at a rate higher than what we can provide it. Okay. Now, if we're not now, muscle cells, yep. muscle cells will only contract when they get a message from the brain to contract. Right. If the brain senses that the blood glucose level has dropped, it will turn down the intensity at which muscles are being asked to contract, precisely to protect the muscles from expending more energy than is available and thus risking the necrosis. Okay. And that that's is theory in a nutshell. And, okay. And then that is where that's evidenced what we that's what we call fatigue. So sure. in, in muscle or muscle failure. And when we sure. I'm pushing a bunch of weight and I get to a point where I just I can't push it anymore. Yep. So okay. what we always note, and this is what Tim supports his idea with, what you always note in an athlete is they will always pull out of an exercise, citing fatigue, exhaustion, inability to continue well before that is actually physiologically so. Right. Muscle cells are absolutely protected from draining their resources. What you have is an ability to use resource between the resting level of resource use, which is almost none, mm -hmm. to the exhaustive level of resource use, at which time you, you are caved in, you stop, but never during anywhere along that spectrum are the actual amount of resources drained to zero. The ATP is maintained rock solid, as we spoke about earlier. Mm -hmm. It does not drop. The glycogen level drops, and we'll come back to that in a minute. The level of glucose in the blood drops. Tim says the dropping of the glucose in the blood is the thing that tells our brain to tell the muscles not to contract so much, to slow down, to feel fatigued, to pull out, to psychologically stop. Mm -hmm. Tim uses that as his argument. It says the governor theory is correct and it's the overriding thing. Of course, it's the overriding thing. Your brain runs everything he says. Now, I'm not saying Tim's wrong. But what I'm saying is I think Tim has missed something else as well. Okay. There's an additional bit of information which doesn't invalidate Tim's central governor theory. I believe the central governor is in effect. Mm -hmm. Yes, your blood glucose drops, your brain says, whoops, I'm tired, let's just call it here a bit. Yes, that happens before you can biochemically say this person is exhausted because they're right. not. Right. So yes, there is muscle protection. However, go back to the model I proposed earlier, which is not actually a model, it's a fact. Mm -hmm. Mitochondria, PCR, translating the energy between the mitochondria and the sliding filaments sliding filaments, let's go another step again. Cell membrane of the muscle cell, excitable okay. tissue. Okay, if a muscle cell is at rest and ready to contract, ready to react to a nerve impulse, it is what they call polarized. Mm -hmm. What that means is that a number of different ions are pumped against their concentration gradients across the membrane of that muscle cell, such that if we open certain doors to allow those things to pour back through in their, according to their concentration gradients, that's how the message for a muscle cell to contract is 
communicated to a muscle. What do we have to do to pump ions against their concentration gradients? What do we have to do? I mean, chemicals, it's you a have signal, to use right? ATP I mean, to signal. achieve that. Okay. That's what we have to do. It's an ATP powered process. So how I said the ATP level is rock solid in the cell. Mm -hmm. Yes, but it does drop very, very slightly when you're exercising at a high intensity, very slightly. Here's the thing. That means that the period of time required for full resolution and full repletion of everything in a muscle cell in between those spikes is lengthened by the fact that the ATP level has to come up just that bit further than it did before. Mm -hmm. That means that muscle will not contract any quicker than its minimum refraction period. Okay. Ergo, while the central governor may well be correct, so is the peripheral governor. Absolutely. Muscles are absolutely self-protecting because the second, the microsecond you drop the ATP concentration, even by a minuscule amount, that cell will take that bit longer to replete. That cell will not be able to pump those ions out as quickly. Therefore, that cell will not contract for slightly longer. You cannot contract a muscle cell that's not polarized. It okay. will not does that signal. Does that have a uh, an expand? I guess expanding uh, expanding effect the more reps you're doing. So if I'm doing ten reps or five reps, let's say maybe mm -hmm. I don't have that drop in ATP. But if I'm doing fifteen reps, maybe in between each rep, oh, maybe it's good for the first five. But then when I get to six, mm -hmm. seven, eight, nine, ten, that gap starts getting a little bit bigger each time. And so on top of the central governor, I'm running out of glycogen, but I'm also getting that gap in between my ATP replenishment to right. be larger Which each rep. Which is precisely that why the seventh or eighth rep on an exhaustive set is going to be slower than the first rep. Gotcha. There's less power to be had. Okay. I.e. that muscle cell is protecting itself from putting out more power than there is resources to, to fuel, to subserve thus protecting itself from tetanus, irreversible locking up, and cell necrosis. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we're looking at and two that's backed layers. up by the central governor. So you've got right. peripheral governor, you've got central governor, both working in concert to ensure absolutely that muscles, resources remain relatively stable. Yeah. And it's performance that suffers in order to subserve the absolute protection of the resources so that the cell can continue to live to fight another day. Okay. Now, one of the things, and this is from what I've gathered, there's a little bit difference in the central governor theory from what I understood from listening to a video of Professor Noakes is he was talking primarily about the central governor being a way for the brain to protect itself, regardless of fuel stores in the muscle. Right. Is that you're talking about specifically muscles? What's the difference between those two ideas? Well, I mean, both tissues are using energy. Mm -hmm. If you are exercising intensively, you your muscles your muscles are working intensively, absolutely, and using resource. But mm -hmm. so is your brain. So is your nervous system because your brain has to program all these motor movements decide which motor units to recruit at which instant in which order, send all those messages down through the central nervous system, which also takes energy to transmute those messages from one end to the other and all mm -hmm. need replenishing in between each impulse using ATP. Mm -hmm. So it, it's really a, a means of the body to protect itself from using its resources. Gotcha. Okay. So what happens is your ability to use resources can speed up as much as your ability to replete those resources can speed up. Yeah, you'd see, you, I swear you read my mind every time. I was just going to talk about, we talked about a little bit earlier, like the replenishment of, of resources. Mm. Do we have data on glycogen replenishment? And the reason I'm asking is this whole conversation, pretty much everything we're talking about in this, in this call today or talk today is really answering the question, um, and giving some background to people about why being ketogenic and, a, and an athlete works. Yeah. Right. There's, there's no issues here, basically, no. is what we're trying to explain. 
So yep. all of the arguments that I've heard from everybody is you need glycogen to replenish. You need glycogen to keep yes. your stores up so you don't run out of fuel. Yes. You need, all right. of these things. It's like, okay, great. These are This is why you don't need to eat it. So what yeah. is the, do we have data on replenishment times? Like, well, okay, before we even get to that, do we have to even worry about running out of glycogen? And no, that's the first thing, because I hear people all the time talking about uh, gly- uh, carb depletion workouts and all these other yeah. types of things. Right. Okay. What we've just described, the effects of the both the peripheral and central governors working in concert together, yep. they absolutely protect the muscle cell from dropping the glycogen level below a minimum survivable level that will be a distress on that cell and it will be a signal for that cell to store more at rest ongoingly the recovery process Mm -hmm. yes okay but you cannot drain your cell of glycogen you say that again the level that's what exercise (laughs) does you cannot drain it it is physically impossible to achieve. So the idea of a carb it. depletion, Die. yeah. So the idea of a carb depletion uh, workout or a a workout where we're because I, I know there's there's a lot of people that are big on cyclic cyclic keto. They're yep. you know working out working out really hard. They have one workout. They do like 500 reps of every body part to completely deplete yeah. their glycogen stores, Not and advice. then they go out for like two days and eat nothing but carbs to replenish it for yep. some reason, and then do this yep. stuff. It's like I I don't understand Just rubbish. Right. Yeah, just, just rubbish. Yeah, that's just that's just anti-scientific claptrap. That's just rubbish. Yes, exercise will reduce your glycogen level below the resting level. Mm-hmm. All exercise, not just high intensity exercise, all exercise will mm-hmm. do that to some degree. Um, moderate and low intensity, long lasting exercise, which is the kind you should avoid anyway, will reduce that glycogen level from resting level much less. Than high intensity work will do, but nonetheless, yeah. there's a slight drop. Yeah. Um, you cannot drain your glycogen below the critical level. It is protected. It is the training status that will cause you to increase your resting level mm-hmm. so that next time getting to that critical level is a, is a longer journey, i.e., your performance improves. Right. That's what it is. Right. Okay. Yeah. So, next question. We've been talking a lot about carbs. We've been talking a lot about muscles. You said there is no difference between anaerobic and aerobic type work. Mm-hmm. Then explain to me the fat burning zone. Yeah. And what is that's that all based, about? Again, that's based on the assertions that will be made by people who undertake respiratory gas analysis, which is used to estimate reasonably closely. Mm-hmm the contributions of free fatty acids and carbohydrates to the substrate being oxidized by the mitochondria. At higher intensities of exercise, precisely because of the increased rate of glycogenolysis, Mm -hmm. there is a higher level of pyruvate pooling in the cell, which will push its way through the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex more rapidly, therefore, producing acetylcoenzyme A from that source, therefore, thus locking out the fat at that time. Mm-hmm. So what they're saying to people is if you want to burn fat during exercise, you need to keep the exercise intensity below a certain level individual to you. Right. That means that you're burning more fat and less carbohydrate. Except that won't work. Because that level and intensity of exercise will cause you precisely to feel more hungry than you would have done if you had you undertaken the high intensity short lasting protocol. Mm. And that type of exercise will strip muscle mass off your body, which will reduce your basal metabolic rate, which will mean that your capacity to eat food without storing excess substance, excess mass from your food as fat, Mm -hmm. not Mm -hmm. calories, mass. because calories are heat and heat are photons and photons don't weigh anything. So how can they possibly make you fat? Anyway, that's for another day. Um, <laughs> I, I just love this stuff. It's just hilarious. It's um, awesome. No, this with is, another great set this is great stuff. So you, mm-hmm. you just said something. Okay. So let's go one more dig into something. And that is helping people understand what BMR is. Yeah. Um, I tell people all the time that I, I personally, when I'm working with clients and I'm talking to people, I look at, 
BMR is, I want to see it go up. I want to see it go higher. And I look at it, I say, look, I look at this and this may be incorrect, but this is how I view it. I look at BMR as an efficiency rating. I don't look at Mm -hmm. it as a, how many calories are you burning? Like I'm looking at, I want to see you losing body fat, gaining muscle. When you gain muscle, your BMR is going to go up. I don't care what your total weight is. So that's what I want to see. I want to see your BMR increase. And a lot of people are kind of like, well, but if I wanted to go down, I'm trying to lose weight, I'm doing this. Like, can you explain what BMR actually is? Because I I explain it as it's the total function of your body. It's It's not just- basal metabolic rate is what it is. Yeah. At rest, doing nothing but lying down absolutely still in bed, for example. That's what your basal metabolic rate is. How much substance, how much mass of food are you oxidizing per unit time to produce enough ATP to keep you alive? That will depend on the rate of ATP use. One of the tissues in your body that uses ATP at a higher rate than anything else is muscle mass. If you have more muscle mass, you will use more ATP per unit time just to be alive, just to keep that muscle mass polarized. Mm -hmm ready for work so more muscle mass means a higher metabolic rate that means you'll use more food mass doesn't uh doing more thinking do are there because i i've been reading a little bit more in brain metabolism and how the brain uses energy it's like 20 percent of your total metabolic rate right yep and if you and you actually burn more fuel when you're thinking hard things like when you're going through things and you're spending more brain like people that do like hard labor utilizing mm. less brain energy than people that are working, you know, yeah. scientists yeah. and doing whatever else. Yeah, exactly. Interesting. Mm. Or if you're Greg Doucette, tying your shoelaces increases your brain. About <laughs> 100%. 100%. So, okay. This is a totally off the wall question. Yeah. If someone wants to increase their metabolic rate, would reading mm-hmm. more each day help? Probably not hugely. Okay. What kind of mental activity makes a difference? Does it matter? Um, stuff that really requires you to think, make calculations, draw okay. in different um, areas of the brain, music. So crossword puzzles. Possibly. Things playing like a that. musical instrument. It's, okay. Learning a new yeah. language. Actively producing music, I mean, rather than passively listening to it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know. That's interesting. Okay. I think we just, I think we just discovered a new biohack. There you go. <laughs> Use your brain yeah. and lose fat. There's a book. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> All right, my man. I better race because I've got the next thing hard on the heels as it always is. Because absolutely, man. Absolutely, a busy man with such a such a demand on my time. You know? Well, <laughs> and you're doing so many things, man. I appreciate you being on. Where can people find you? Always a pleasure, Bronson. Thank you very much for having me once again. Um, and people can find me right about there. Okay. That's it. Awesome. Uh, look, if you if you go to any search engine of your choice and type in Bart K, you cannot fail to find me. Um, The first five or six pages will be either things I've produced or other people producing things, saying things about me that are nonsense. (laughs) (laughs) I appreciate you being on, man. Thank you very much. Pleasure. See you again.